hide it. Okay? So, so unlike Ghazali, for instance, if you th think for one second about Ghazali's project, what was Ghazali's project about? It was a critique of naturalistic metaphysics manifested in Mu'tazali thought and the falsafa of Ibn Sina, okay? And trying to transform it from an epistemic perspective and tabulating it in a very interesting way. So that was a universal project. A universal project was, that was picked up by Averroes, okay? Ibn Rushd later, okay? And I don't think that they were contraries as many Orientalists are trying to convince us they are, okay? And critiqued and sustained in a very interesting way. So, how do we deal with that? So we have that problem. We have that bifurcated subject, okay? We have that dualistic schizophrenic subject, okay? That is both subject and object. And we are trying to appropriate the tradition. And by the way, I'm not the first one to use the word appropriate. Abdel Hamid Sabra uh, of Harvard around 20 or 30 years ago said very intelligently that Muslims never received Greek philosophy. They appropriated Greek philosophy. So how do we deal with that? Now, of course, we always use the word tradition, taqlid, or, or, or a turath al-Islami. Okay. I find this word horrific because it deals, it leads to two main problems. What I call the modernist problem and the traditionalist problem. And I want to challenge both of them, okay? The tradition, okay, the word tradition, when it is thought by a modernist, people like Muhammad Abdu and, and Afghani and so on, uh, they reduce the tradition to uh, a number of, of very generic statements. Like, for instance, you read Muhammad Abdu, he tells you, Islam and Aql. Okay, fine. What reason do you talk about? Okay. And what kind of rationality are we talking about here? And how can it deal with the specific problems? You don't get any answer, actually. And I think that problem, many of the Tanzimat thinkers as well fell into. Okay? And plus that issue of modernist, that, that, that modernist perspective runs a, big, runs a big risk because once you say Islam and modernity is the same thing because Islam is interested in Aql, and now that we are living in the aftermath of modernity, modernity died around 70 years ago, okay, after World War II, then you are, we are essentially saying that Islam has died. Now let us go to the, our traditionalist friend, and these are the ones I have in mind because I think this is a danger we are living nowadays very much. Okay, traditionalism also had its own metamorphosis. Okay, you know like bees and <laughs> when they go through metamorphosis. So you have the textual metamorphosis, which was a clear, a clear product of the systems of historical philology, which were a product of the power knowledge relations that were trying that were manifesting the interest in representation and the crisis of representation in the 18th century, okay? And you have what I find now to be a traditionalism in reading, for instance, Islamic philosophy in particular, uh, in connection, uh, in connection, uh, sorry, in reading Islamic philo uh, uh, philosophy in connection with philology. So you have people saying, okay, Ibn Sina is enough for me. Fine, and I'm happy with this. Ibn Sina can be enough. But the question is, how are you going to read Ibn Sina? Okay? Am I going to read Ibn Sina in terms of the philological systems that have been set according to a crisis of representation that is a product, okay, of a Protestant condition in the 17th and 18th century? Or am I going to create a new system Okay, of philology and appropriate the tradition in a completely different way. Not only that, but we are also running another big issue with the tradition. And this is where I will very briefly, in just one minute, and, but you have it in the outline that I distributed, and I'm very grateful to my friend who's not here, Mehmet Bulgan of Marmara Kalam, who kindly translated <laughs> that outline very generously uh, last week. So the um, the the major philosopher, the major thinker of tradition in the 20th century is Martin Heidegger. Let us take Martin, because, and Martin Heidegger is a very interesting figure to consider. Because Martin Heidegger was trying to, resp uh, to respond to the crisis of 
the empirical transcendental duplet. He was trying to get out of the crisis of the structure of subjectivity in the 19th century, and he suggested tradition as a way out of it. This is why I find many Muslim thinkers, maybe here in Turkey, there are many big names here in Turkey, and many also in the Arab world who are very much interested in Heidegger. But where did Heidegger end? Because Heidegger ended with a disaster. Okay, so Heidegger tried to bring the Alteglish, okay, the everyday, the traditional, as a way of fixing meaning, of appropriating meaning in, in day to day life. Okay, but he didn't realize at the end, okay, that that project, once you take away all rational frames and you reduce every, or you find only tradition, or you place only tradition as the soul definer or the sole source of meaning that you end up with cultural fascism. Okay, so it's my historical destiny, for instance, to grow in Egypt or the US. So it's my historical destiny to embrace that. And hence, the entire project of the meaning of being of Heidegger, okay, the Bedeutung, okay, of Sein, okay, in Heidegger, ended up in historical fascism. And hence, his acceptance, not only acceptance, his endorsement of the Nazi project in the 1930s, which was a disaster, actually. And not only that, but also his Nazi appropriations by figures like Carl Schmitt and others, okay? So where to go? And this is where I would like, I, I know I'm running out of time very quickly, where to go? What I am suggesting in Leo of both the traditionalist and the modernist readings, okay, as a way of appropriating meaningfully, that is, as a source of meaning, the Islamic philosophical tradition is essentially an aporeia-based approach, a problem-based approach. And let me give three very quick examples, and I will be more than happy to, appropriate, uh, to uh, elaborate on that in the Q&A period. And I'm also happy to, uh, to elaborate on this within my own research, which I'm more than happy to, because this is, what I have been trying to do since I got my PhD four years ago, okay? Uh, instead of reading the tradition from a historical philological perspective or a modernist violent perspective that does violence to the meaning, we can look at the problems of the tradition, okay? Now there are three aporeas that I think define the Islamic rational tradition, not only in philosophy, but across kalam and usul, okay, and mantiq. The first one, which you have in the paper, is the epistemic remolding of metaphysics, or other word, in other words, the epistemic critique of metaphysics, okay? Or to be more precise, of essentialism, number one. Number two, uh, imagination and the mind-body problem. In the history of Western philosophy, we have a crisis of duality from the time of Plato and Aristotle till now, okay? And philosophy of mind is still wrestling with. Muslims did something that is very unique in the history of Islamic philosophy, in the history of philosophy in general, which is that to try to overcome this problem through a very interesting faculty, which is a faculty of imagination. This is one of them. The third one, which is now my concern as I have a growing interest in philosophy of science, moving away from philosophy of human nature, is modal logic, okay? And the questions of deductive-based systems of knowledge. Okay, so in one minute, you, this is how for it, and originally I was supposed to present on Galambavi, by the way, on <laughs> temporal modalities and, and, and, and, uh, and the problem of nomological claims or nomic claims, that is, problems of laws of nature. Okay, but I will very briefly talk about how to do this. Okay, when you read someone like Galambavi, okay, and you see that he is essentially extending a very old criticism of the theory of essences in naming, okay? And then he is adding the temporal dimensions of the modal operators, which is my translation of al muajihat al mantaqiyya okay? You find a very, very interesting ways in which Galambavi immediately responds to problems raised by someone like David Lewis, for instance. And the debate that we are having now as a result of the crisis of representation, but that in, not in continental philosophy, but rather in analytical philosophy, between the Armstrongian slash Dretzka 
camp of understanding uh, natural laws in terms of universals versus the Humean slash David Lewis camp of understanding uh, um, um, uh, laws of nature as essentially inductive through the system of Humean supervenience and trying to find modal answers to this. This doesn't mean that you are going to strip Kalambavi or Galambavi of his historical context, but you are going to look at the problem, and even if you are going to do philological analysis, your philological analysis, because it is driven by the problem and not by trying, say, to deny the decline thesis, which is a nonsense thesis that I think we spend so much time trying to deny it as if the Orientalist scholarship on Islamic philosophy is anything to be taken seriously in the first place. Okay, so I will stop here and I will open the room for question. I'm very sorry I took more time than I should. And I will, I'm more than happy to elaborate on any point. And again, thank you so much for the generous invitation. As a junior scholar, it's an honor to be here and it's an honor to be on the opening panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Evet, Sayın Ahmet e, Abdülmecid'e çok teşekkür ediyoruz. İslam felsefesinin hem temellerini hem de gelecek perspektif içerisinde e, sorunlarını ve e, izlenecek yöntemleri e, anlatmış oldu. <gülüyor> Böylece <gülüyor> 18. 18. yüzyıl Osmanlı uleması başlıklı e, oturumumuzu burada sonlandırmış oluyoruz. E, birinci oturumumuzu burada bitir bitiriyoruz. Bundan sonraki e, oturum saat 11'de başlayacak. 11'deki oturumda buluşmak üzere Hepinize teşekkür ediyorum. Çok teşekkür ederim. Hemen değerli akademisyenlerimize, Sayın Oturum Başkanımıza, rektörümüze çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Birinci oturumumuzun sonuna geldik değerli misafirlerimiz. Son dakikalık kısa bir aramız var. Sonrasında hemen ikinci oturumumuza ivedi bir şekilde geçeceğiz. Zira Cuma öncesinde ikinci oturumu tamamlamak istiyoruz.